Well, welcome back, everyone, to our daily devotions. We're continuing our journey through the book of Revelation, and we've titled today's devotional, We Reap What We Sow. You know, one of my desires for doing this devotional was that it would take a look at Revelation through the lens of application. What I didn't want to do is have like a doctrinal class. I'm all for doctrine. I think the fascinating study of eschatology and end times is truly uh, inspiring, um, eye-opening, and and certainly at times horrifying. Um, And so rather than going through all the different positions of when the rapture is going to happen and when when this is going to take place in terms of representing all the different views that are out there, I wanted to share with you uh, my interpretation Um, as hopefully you have caught on uh, through this study, it's been made clear, but I really wanted to focus on letting the book of Revelation, like the other books of the Bible, be an instrument of application in our life that would encourage us to grow closer in our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, Um, just have a deeper appreciation for the gospel, God's sovereignty, and his holiness. And I truly believe as we come to uh, these verses, verses 5 and 7 of Revelation 16, I think uh, this really puts it into perspective for us. And this theme, by the way, of sowing and reaping is something you can find throughout the Bible. See, Scripture abounds with the words of life. You can't help but find words for life, the word of life, as you open the Bible. Even though these are what would be classified as ancient truths, They are so special, so significant, so relevant to you and I um, all these years later because this is a living document. This is the oracle. This is the heart of God. And so one of those transformational truisms that we find in God's word is that we reap what we sow. And so both the Old and the New Testament in perfect concert give us this understanding and it warns about the dangers um, as well as the joys of sowing It talks about the positive effects of sowing righteously and the negative effects of sowing unrighteously. And as we look to the Bible, the message is clear. You sow righteousness, guess what? You're going to reap blessing. You sow faith, well, you're going to reap a harvest of strength and peace. You sow obedience, uh, you're going to reap the wind of God's comfort and God's confidence. It's just going to happen. On the other hand, if we sow wrongdoing, we're going to reap regret and eventually heartache. You know, nobody just arrives at the pit. Nobody just finds themselves in a ditch. Usually there has been seeds that have been sown uh, that have now come to pass, and it's been an unhealthy harvest, if you will. And so we want to look at this understanding of reaping and sowing and sowing and reaping. And I mean, just right off the top, Uh, Jesus, many of his parables tied in on this. In fact, we did a whole series on this. Uh, Jesus touched on this numerous times, this agricultural illustration of sowing and reaping. Uh, But take notice of what it says in the Old Testament. You know, Job's friends, they didn't necessarily have the right target for their message, but a lot of their message was correct in terms of uh, some of their theology and some of their, their practical application of that. And here's one of them in Job 4, 8. This is what was said. As I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. So if we're sowing iniquity, if I'm sowing sin, I might get away with it for a while, but eventually I'm going to reap trouble. I'm going to reap pain. I'm going to reap perhaps a financial issue. I might reap a health issue. I might reap relational problems. I might reap a world of guilt if I keep on in in iniquity. And so we want to be careful and we want to take inventory of that. Hosea 8.7 says it this way, for they sow the wind and they shall reap a whirlwind. You know, eventually it's going to come back at you. If we're sowing against God and against his will, we're going to reap a storm. On the other hand, those who sow in tares shall reap with shouts of joy, just to not spend too much time on this verse, but just to give you the understanding, once again, when you're sowing obedience, you will reap joy. I know a lot of people give being committed to God a bad rap, um, but I've never met any, in all my years, I've never met one person who regretted 
faithfully following the Lord. It, it just, it reaps blessing after blessing, shouts of joy. And then of course, Galatians 6, 7 in the New Testament, Paul says to the church of Galatia, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. God is not mocked. Um, there is gonna come a day when everybody who has blasphemed God, has blasphemed the Lord, has blasphemed the Spirit, everybody who has, uh, who has really tried to trample the work of God, to oppose the work of God. I saw somebody in, in, in a, an outdoor rally recently and they had a sign that said, if, when Jesus comes back again, kill him again. And I thought, how terrible is that? And I pray for that person, that that person, that he comes to Christ. But if he doesn't, we must realize God will not be mocked. Just because you have freedom of speech in America, I have freedom of speech in America, doesn't mean that God is not taking an account of all that is said. He will not be mocked. And we will have to answer. We have to realize that. Now, this message of sowing and reaping also finds its way in the book of Revelation. No surprise there. And it really frames these last bold judgments, really all the judgments in the tribulation, but particularly uh, these bold judgments. And the last two that we just read, which was uh, uh, really God organizing a calculated attack and a hit upon the world's water system. But look what it says here in Revelation 16, five and seven, and then we'll just back it up and explain. Uh, this is what John says. And I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, just are you. O holy one, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments, verse six, for they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. You know, at this juncture now in the tribulation, you have already had, as we've mentioned, the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and now you have the bold judgments unfolding. And the last two judgments in particular required the angel who is in charge of the waters to pause and say this, because the calamities that will unfold after the world's water system is hit once again um, will, will be catastrophic. We must realize that. As I mentioned in the previous devotion, it is incomprehensible for us to think of there being a water supply given how much of the earth is occupied by water, water that we see on the surface and water under the surface. But it will happen. Uh, with these bold judgments, God uh, will allow um, the ocean and the riverbeds and all bodies of water to be impacted, so much so that marina life will die. The waters will be in just in an unprecedented state of pollution. You know, we look at pollution today and we go, oh, it's terrible. This will, be, this will be off the charts. It will really put people into a panic. And then as we mentioned in the previous devotion as well, because of the angels restricting the winds and the two witnesses, most likely Moses and Elijah, uh, essentially shutting the skies and the heavens from rain, uh, you will have a water supply system problem. The hydraulic system will be incredibly impacted. And so this will be the most severe place the earth has ever been in, so much so that before we get to the rest of the bold judgments, the angel has to say this. It's as if God wants all the world to know that he is just. You know, God's a just God. He's merciful. Even as we get ready to read the rest of these bold judgments, you're going to hear pretty much up until almost the end, you're going to hear God saying in his word that they did not repent, which means God still left the door open, but people will were unwilling. And so he's a just God. He's also a merciful God. But there's going to come a time when the world is going to reap what it has been sowing. And certainly people that die before this without Christ and people who die opposing Christ will reap uh, of course, uh, their end in that respect. But those who are supporting the Antichrist, that's who's in view here, not believers. Those who have taken the mark of the beast, those are two of the same people. Um, also, you're going to throw into the mix here, uh, as we studied the Antichrist, his world empire. He's going to have 10 kings or monarchs under him that lead their regional governments, and they will all coalesce under the flag 
of the Antichrist. And so as you look at this closely, you see the angel is making clear everybody has um, coming to them what they deserve. And that's exactly actually what is said, that they deserve this, um, that they, they are the ones who brought this on by not believing. After numerous warnings and calls to repentance, they unwillingly uh, chose to push God away. You know, when I think of our life right now and, and how we are living, um, I think this applies to us as well. While we may not go through the bold judgments um, per se because we're believers in Jesus Christ, um, not may, we will not go through them. Um, we do still have to take inventory of our own heart and our own life. Are we living righteously before God? Are we giving the appearance to everybody that we're sowing righteousness, but really behind closed doors, we're sowing darkness? Now, here's the thing. Nobody's judging anybody. We all struggle. We all have problems. Let us be clear and upfront about that. No need to put on a mask. We got to be transparent with each other. But we also have to say, how long? What's it going to take? Is it going to take a trip to the hospital? Is it going to take an accident? What's it going to take for me and for you to get it through our thick heads that God loves us, he cares for us, but like a loving parent, he's not going to tolerate our nonsense. And so he puts this before us as a reminder, really as a beckoning to understand that God is holy and he calls us to follow suit. And so together, we need to ask the Lord to search our hearts. And we got to get it right. We got to get it together. We have to remember that if we sow disobedience and selfishness and laziness, we will only reap regret. There is no upside. Let me be clear. There's no silver lining to disobedience before God. Yes, in the moment, the sin feels good. We've all been there. But the fallout, oh, the fallout. We don't want the fallout. I know I don't. I know you don't. We reap what we sow. However, though, on the other side, when we sow faith, obedience, and commitment, we will reap a harvest of blessing. Now, that blessing, by the way, is for God to decide. That blessing for those in relationships right now, uh, that blessing could be a unified home. That blessing could be a stronger relationship with a parent or a child, or a sibling, a spouse. If you're single, sowing obedience and remaining pure, I know I live in 2020, are you crazy? Guess what? You're going to sow God's blessing, and you're going to avoid making mistakes that, that really could bankrupt you emotionally, spiritually, and financially if you're not careful. And so you want to sow obedience as it pertains to, to your purity and your singleness, and trust that God's going to bring ladies, the, the right man who's seeking after God, and, and guys, uh, the right lady in his time. Um, you know, maybe it's, it's in your career. Yeah, it's easy to take a shortcut, but if you do it God's way, oh, he's going to reward you. You know, even our prayers sometimes, we pray very small prayers. You know, we're praying for crumbs when God wants to give us a banquet table. When you sow obedience and faith, it opens that perspective up. It helps you and I look at life through the eyes of faith. Same thing for our children. We all have hopes and prayers, our grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews. It's so very important that we are committed to checking our heart when we go off course and that we're committed to sowing faith, obedience, and commitment to God. It will yield blessing after blessing. And as you've heard us say before, you cannot outgive God. The act of sowing righteousness and sowing faith and obedience is like an offering. Offerings are not just limited to finances. Really, our life is to be a lit way to be a living offering, as it says in Romans 12:1. So as we act as this essential living sacrifice before God, and we're sowing that which He approves of, um, trust and know without a shadow of a doubt that God will reward that and he will bless that. And again, whether it's financial, relational, occupational, emotional, you know, some of us, we're waiting for healing to happen. The sowing doesn't automatically give you a healing, uh, but it does help you to trust God for the healing. It's not up to me or you to try to quantify and work all that out. We do know that God calls us to pray for healing and for breakthrough, nothing wrong with that. But we can't be praying for those incredible blessings, yet 
be sowing iniquity the other days of the week. We want to be consistent. So let's put it together. Let's have great faith. Let's trust God. It's not mystical. It's not just based on emotion. It's not just based on logical thought or intellectual knowledge. It's based on faith and trusting God, trusting that he shall supply for our needs according to his riches and glory, that God has called us to trust him by sowing his way, and we will reap what we need. So I close with another verse from Hosea in the Old Testament, Hosea 10, 12. Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap steadfast love. Break up your foul ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, that he may come and reign, I love this, righteousness on you. God wants to rain his blessings on you. You know, we did a whole series on sowing and reaping. Um, I don't think you can get enough of this in the Bible. It's like a message that we need to constantly put before us because it's a gut check. It's a heart check. But it also, it's just encouraging to know that God is faithful and that God will bless you and I as we sow seeds of righteousness. And so uh, trust me, you're gonna hear this again very soon. Um, we all wanna be encouraged this way. You know, one of the best ways we can walk the path and stay on the path that God has called us is to be reminded of that which is attached to those who sow the way God wants them to sow. So may God give each of us strength. We all need it because we all wanna sow the wrong way. May he give us strength and may he give us the wisdom that comes from his holy word to sow the way he wants us to sow. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we humbly confess that we have sown in iniquity. We have sown gossip. We have sown deceit. We have sown lies. We have sown laziness, selfishness, and disobedience. Thank you for your love and your forgiveness. Thank you for this reminder, even here in the book of Revelation, that all of these judgments, all the seal judgments, all the trumpet judgments, and now these opening bowl judgments, that this was deserved. We truly reap what we sow. And we know that is true in the Old Testament. We know that is true in the New Testament and here in the book of Revelation, in the tribulation. But it's also true in our own heart and our own life right now. Give us strength, oh God. We all need it to sow the way you want us to sow. And to you be the glory for the blessings that we're going to reap. We sow these prayers and we look to reap your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.